certainly loyalty and attachment and bonding go back to day one, and maybe even in utero. We are dependent on an other to feed us and hold us rock us, sing to us, out of that attachment comes loyalty. The mother's placenta, the umbilical cord, her body takes care of everything. And often the very vague archetypal memory of that can haunt us. Consequently, we can be so easily seduced by any kind of an authority figure who says that they will do it for us, and that we can inch towards that blissful dependency where little to nothing is required from us. So this seems like a particularly timely Mm. (laughs) topic because so many people are clinging to an idea of political loyalty, being loyal to a particular political party, being loyal to a philosophy, being loyal to one political leader or another, and sometimes either to ourselves or as we observe other people, we may find this mysterious and hard to understand. So hopefully today's podcast is going to shed a little bit of light on what are we seeing and how can we understand something about human nature, secondary to whatever we happen to be loyal to. So the first thing that I'd like to just throw on the table is that loyalty in and of itself for most people is rather unconscious, that it's something that they discover. And then, of course, we hope over time as we become more aware that it becomes a choice, that we know our values And consequently, we find a representative or a group that's aligned with the values that we've discovered in ourselves. But foremost, loyalty is somewhat instinctive, often unconscious. And Deb, I was thinking about your mentioning of how the infant attaches to the authority figures, to the caregivers. Absolutely. You know, I always, I'm aware that I often mention uh, developmental sort of tap roots and origins of things, because I think as we grow, uh, those themes can grow along with us. It's like a spiral that the same, the same idea comes up again and again, uh, but at a higher level of awareness. But certainly loyalty and attachment and bonding go back to day one, and maybe even in utero, of we are dependent on an other to come and meet our needs, to feed us and hold us, rock us, sing to us, and and intuit whether we're too hot or too cold or whatever it might be. And that out of that attachment, that necessary instinctual bond, Comes, comes loyalty. Even uh, children who are neglected or abused are loyal to that parent, turn to that parent, depend on that parent. So it has its roots in early dependency. And that weaves right into the foundation. I mean, when we think of ourselves as infants, or fantasize about it. You know, we come out of the womb, which, by the way, is highly upsetting, distressing. <laughs> and <then> we, <laughs> it's very disruptive. I was having disrupt- a fine time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then you know. what happened? <laughs> um, and, you know, often the first person that comforts us is, is our mother. Yes. Takes us to her, her heartbeat, the scent of her, the, the nursing and then a lifelong process of alignment with our primary caregiver. Evolutionary psychologists suggest this makes perfect sense. You should be as seamlessly aligned with whatever figure is making sure that you stay alive. Yeah. 
You know, and but I like what you said, Joseph, about, you know, then all of a sudden there is the awful experience of childbirth, this horrible disruption, transgression, and a kind of betrayal of the the peaceful, you know, what I imagine as this peaceful Uroboric floating in an oceanic world. And it is traumatizing uh, for uh, childbirth can be very traumatizing. So so there it is. Uh, Status quo, all is well. I can safely depend. And then this disruption, which is going to happen again and again and again. And talking about that blissful Ouroboric state, and for those who are new to that term, the Ouroboros is a very ancient, oft-repeated symbol of a serpent eating its own tail, creating a kind of circular containment. So we have some kind of deep kinesthetic cellular memories of a bliss. And the bliss involves a system where we don't have to do anything. (laughs) You don't have to breathe. Ah. You don't have to eat. You don't even have to poop. You don't have to clean yourself. That the mother's placenta, the umbilical cord, her body takes care of everything. And then you're just kept in this wonderful, temperature-controlled, buffered environment. And often the very vague archetypal memory of that can haunt us. Often people, for instance, that feel suicidal are longing unconsciously to go back to the Great Mother, for there is nothing that they need to do. Consequently, we can be so easily seduced by any kind of an authority figure who says that they will do it for us, and that we can inch towards that blissful dependency where little to nothing is required from us. So that can be a kind of seductive loyalty or a drive to want to go back to that state where so little is asked of us. Well, we are contained. You know, we are safe. Uh, And, you know, the birth experience and then growing up and not getting our needs met all the time at the very instant that we have that need produces anxiety. And, you know, we we all are familiar with the so-called terrible twos of the development of ego where, you know, this toddler uh, sometimes very charmingly just says, no. (laughs) I remember offering uh, our, at that stage, offering our son, you know, something good, something that he liked. So I'll say a cookie because he was just caught in this web of no, no, no. And for I said, well, you know, do you want a cookie? And he said, no. And then all of a sudden he realized what he'd said. And, <laughs> and I, I was just playing because it was just, um, you know, he's two and a half or three and obviously just being a little boy. But I think that that anxiety, when we start to realize on the, on the plus side, I have an I. And sometimes what mom asked me to do is not what I want to do. I don't feel like eating dinner right now or putting my shoes on or any of that stuff. And and we want that to happen. But it's also very anxiety producing uh, that then the external authority says, too bad, um, it is dinner time. Or you do have to wear your shoes if you're going outside. Of it sets up a lot of ambivalence and a lot of inner conflict. And I think that then plays out with how else, where else, to whom else, to what else can I safely just belong? Because at that point, and I think forever after in a way, you know, 
that kid is little and the world is really big and we need a place to turn. So this evokes something about attachment theory, which I think is really relevant because the more that I deeply feel my way into attachment theory, the more it really describes how people relate to all Mm. kinds of things, not just a primary partner, but a political party, a church, their job. So in secure attachment, which I think is what you were describing with your son, that there's a sense that even if we push back, even if we're full of ferocious needs, or sometimes we're not very gratifying to our parents, that we're loved, and that the parent is ultimately going to be with us, is going to be benign and loving, and is going to meet our needs. And as adults, that gives us a sense that we can trust that the people, the systems, the job, the friends that we have become attached to perhaps even reliant on, are fundamentally decent and that they're going to be there for us and we for them so that we don't have to be anxiously worried about that or we don't have to fear them in any way. And that becomes a just a foundational stance. So the example of your son is great. Because there's a secure attachment, you can afford to disagree. <laughs> with the authority figure. Yes, no, I want this, you know, this, that, push, do. And there's a trust that nothing catastrophic is going to happen. That's a healthy relationship. When the child's needs are not met often, and there's too much distance between the caregiver and the child, The child can develop an anxious, preoccupied attachment. And in that kind of an attachment, there's always an over-monitoring of whatever we're attached to, to make sure that we're not going to be abandoned, to make sure everything is okay. And so there is often an abandonment of oneself and a constant hovering. Um, Are we okay? Are we okay? Is everything all right? Where were you? What were you doing over there? Um, Open up your phone. Let me see your laptop. You were five minutes late calling them, texting them all day long. But there's a desperate sense of need for whatever we're attached to. But this underlying memory of the authority figure, the caregiver not showing up, and the infant being left for too long in a state of deep and uncomfortable need. So that can make us feel pandering, overly focused on the other person and kind of chronically panicking. The third bit, just to put them all on the table, is a dismissive attachment, which is that the child has lots of needs, but when the caregiver shows up and they meet the needs, they do it in a way that's very uncomfortable for the child. So that could be something as simple as the baby's crying with a wet diaper for long periods of time. The caregiving parent shows up and they change the diaper, but they're kind of rough. Or when they put the diaper on, they put it on too tightly, and so the baby's uncomfortable. Or the baby cries for food and gets the bottle, but the bottle is being pressed unconsciously, too forcefully into the child's face, let's say. And so the child gets its need met, but the process of getting it met is also uncomfortable or even slightly painful. So then when the caregiver shows up to provide something, the child is rearing, pulling back, even as they need various things. So those are... and in adulthood become patterns or styles of loyalty to whatever system or person they rely on. 